Welcome to the Information Systems for Business podcast. I'm your host, Craig Van Slyke. The main purpose of the podcast is to augment the book, Information Systems for Business and Experiential Approach by Franz Belanger, Craig Van Slyke, and Rob Crossler. The book is published by Prospect Press. Before we get started, I want to give a few disclaimers. The podcast purposely omits many details in order to get to the high points of each chapter. So listening to the podcast is not a substitute for reading the book. Each episode contains my view of the most important points of each chapter. Your professor may have a different view. The podcast is solely my responsibility, so any errors are on me, not my co-authors, your professors, Prospect Press, or my employer. Enough of the disclaimers, let's get to the good stuff. In this episode, we provide an overview of the most important points from Chapter 7, Transmitting Information. The focusing story for Chapter 7 is about how mobile Wi-Fi hotspots enable internet connectivity in places where you might not have access to regular Wi-Fi or a wired internet connection. A private hotspot uses a cellular connection to create a private connection to the internet. By the way, I live in a rural area, so internet access is sometimes a little unreliable. I often use a hotspot to access the internet when there's an issue with my main internet service provider. Mobile phone-based hotspots are convenient, but sometimes have limited speed and will drain a phone's battery pretty quickly. Dedicated devices can also be used as hotspots. Hotspots can be internet lifelines for people in rural areas or other areas with poor internet connectivity. That's people like me. The internet has changed the way much of the world lives and works, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Although disconnected devices can still be useful, when we connect a computer to a network, that computer's usefulness goes up dramatically. The purpose of Chapter 7 is to help you understand some basics of how this connectivity works by describing some fundamental networking technologies and methods. There is a lot of detail in Chapter 7, so you need to read the book. Yeah, I know, nag, 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 but trust me, you really need to read the book, especially for this chapter. After the focusing story, Chapter 7 briefly describes some important network devices. This is followed by a discussion of some of the different types of networks used by individuals and organizations. Next, the chapter covers the Internet, which is a network of networks. Again, I'll give you a more detailed definition later on. The next section describes network architectures, which are layouts of how connected devices are supposed to work together. The chapter closes with discussions of Web 2.0 and Web 3.0. Here are the main points from Chapter 7. A computer network is a collection of interconnected devices that allow users and systems to communicate and share resources. A variety of components are used to create a network. A router is an intelligent device that controls the flow of transmissions in and out of a network and routes network traffic to the appropriate devices. Network interface cards provide networks with physical access to a device. Your computer has a network interface card, although sometimes it's just on a single chip rather than in a true expansion card. Repeaters retransmit a data signal that they receive after eliminating noise in the signal and boosting the signal's strength. There are several ways to categorize networks. Two important ways concern whether physical connections are used and the extent of the network's coverage. With respect to physical connections, we talk about wired versus wireless networks. As the name implies, wired networks use physical wires such as Ethernet cables, coax cables, or coaxial cables, that's kind of like cable TV cables, and fiber optic cables, which don't really use wires, while wireless networks use frequencies to transmit data. The familiar Wi-Fi networks that you all know and love are wireless, as the name implies, as are cellular networks and even Bluetooth, but Bluetooth is only used over short distances. Networks can also be classified based on the area they cover. Local area networks, or LANs, connect devices in a limited geographic area, usually less than 5 kilometers while wide area networks, or WANs, connect devices over large geographic areas. The Internet is a publicly accessible worldwide network of networks that uses a specific set of rules called protocols to ensure that the devices connected to the Internet can communicate. Internet backbones carry most of the traffic on the Internet. Every computer that's a full participant in the Internet has a unique address called an IP address. IP stands for Internet Protocol. IPv4 uses four sets of numbers for each address, such as 128.192.68.1, while IPv6 uses six sets of numbers. IPv6 also allows for bigger numbers, so the real change from IPv4 to IPv6 is that a lot more devices can have an IP address. There are many Internet-based applications. Perhaps the one you know the most about is the World Wide Web, or what we call the Web. 
This is technically an application using the internet as its network. The web and the internet are not the same thing. The web runs over the internet. Other internet-based applications include email, instant messaging, video conferencing such as Zoom, and many others. See Table 7.3 for some more examples. Sometimes people confuse two terms, the internet and intranets. An intranet is a non-public network that uses internet protocols, those rules, for communication. The Internet of Things, or IoT, uses the internet to connect physical, everyday objects. You read about this in other chapters, and you'll read more about IoT throughout the book. Network architectures are essentially blueprints for how network devices are supposed to work together. Network architectures are implemented as specific network infrastructures. Think of the architecture as the plan and the infrastructure as the implementation of that plan. Client-server architectures distribute processing and storage tasks between two types of systems, clients and servers. Clients make requests and servers respond to those requests. There's a figure in the book, figure 7.6, that may help you understand this a little bit better. With peer-to-peer -peer architectures, all systems are equal, acting as both clients and servers, sharing resources with one another. Cloud computing is a computing model in which an organization or individual rents computing resources from online providers rather than managing those resources themselves. You probably use a lot of cloud-based services such as Google Docs, Dropbox, or iCloud, and there are tons of others. There are several other architectures mentioned in the book, but you'll have to check those out for yourself. Web 2.0 refers to the second generation of the Internet, which added interactivity. Users became creators of, the, of Internet content through things like blogs, wikis, and social networking services. Web 3.0 is emerging. The distinguishing character of Web 3.0 is computer systems starting to understand the meaning of information and data. We call this the semantic web. Well, that's all for Chapter 7. Uh, this chapter really does have a lot of details, so surprising no one, I urge you to read the book. Okay, that's it for this episode. Remember that you still need to read the chapter since the book has much more detail. Did I mention that yet? Fortunately, we, the co-authors, worked really hard to keep the chapter short and to the point so the reading shouldn't be too bad. Talk to you next time.